don't have a PowerPoint, I don't like them, so you'll forgive me. When I use PowerPoint, it never works. So, <clears throat> let me start with a little bit of background on how I came to be involved in mineral value chains. I also want to put on my stopwatch so that I'm a good boy. Um, about four years ago, uh, Susan Shabangu, the Minister of Mineral Resources, was engaged in a heavy battle with the mining industry over uh, the mining charter and uh, the legislation and so on. And uh, I was in Parliament and was witness to the, the battle going on, which was quite intense. And uh, in the course of that battle, what emerged very clearly was that South Africa is indeed very well endowed, perhaps the best in the world with minerals, and yet its manufacturing sector was very weak and indeed in decline. And uh, this contradiction between the wealth on the one hand and the relative uh, weakness on the other puzzled me a great deal. And I thought that the all the arguments about the mining charter and MPRDA and so on weren't, were not really getting to the heart of the matter. Why was it that a country with such enormous resources uh, firstly had so much poverty and inequality, but uh, even worse than that, uh, so, such a weak industrial manufacturing sector? And I developed a, an insatiable curiosity about this and found it terribly interesting. And uh, having an engineering background, my first step was to look at geology and say, is there a geological problem to explain this contradiction? And uh, it, that, that inquiry led, led me nowhere at all. And then I thought, well, maybe it's metallurgy, namely, how are minerals processed, uh, you know, smelting and all that. And uh, I got in touch with the metallurgists, the Metallurgical Society of South Africa, and I began to ask questions about whether there was some problem with the way minerals were processed. And that didn't take me very far either. And so together with the Industrial Development Corporation and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, we convened a number of conferences where we invited industry, uh, government, experts, and so on, and we discussed first beneficiation in principle, uh, and that produced some insights in what was going wrong in the value chain. And then another conference, which we call the interface between mining and manufacturing, which was even better, and many case studies uh, came forward in, 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 from industry, from both from mining, Chamber of Mines was there, and, and, and from manufacturing, case studies emerged on how the mineral value chain operates in South Africa. And we began to see, began to see where the difficulties lay with respect to particular minerals. And uh, those case studies are recorded and they're being used now and developed further in order to try in a very practical way to understand why a particular mineral of which we have the world's major resource, like manganese, why that isn't turned into something downstream. And uh, so the whole question of the mineral value chain was uh, we started to examine it then, this is a few years ago, and uh, to try and uncover what on earth was going on. And of course, the curious thing about that exercise is that every expert you asked for an opinion on what was uh, not working in the value chain gave you a different answer. <laughs> one expert would say it's uh, electricity, it's energy, another one would say it's transport. If you speak to BHP Billiton, uh, with all the manganese that they've got, and which, of which they export 75%, 25% goes to ArcelorMittal. Uh, if you speak to BHV Bulletin, they will tell you the problem is Transnet, who won't give them a contract, and the port charges, which are so high, 
that, uh, and we were told just last, was it last week by Arsenal Mittau, that to take a shipment from Frerenichang to Durban costs the same as from Durban to China. So this is the kind of information we were gathering and continue to gather, which is, which is to try and explain why the, the upstream and downstream of our mineral value chain is relatively, uh, let's say, in, uh, in not, not as good as it ought to be. And so we get, we pick up answers, and it's quite incredible the way, the more investigation you do, the more interviews you do, the more different answers you get. You get answers about transport, you get answers about labor, uh, uh, labor markets, about energy, about red tape in government, about skills shortages. It's quite incredible. There is no single view that I've come across uh, where you can say as a body of opinion in industry or in mining or even in government, where there's a, an understanding of why our mineral value chains are not more effective. And so this justifies the research that I'm busy with now. And uh, I'm doing some work for the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, which has commissioned me and a team of people uh, to do a study on the mineral value chains in South Africa but in the context of the region and of Africa as a whole. Uh, as you all know, the African mining vision and uh, numerous documents now from the African Union and the African Development Bank and the ECA, who are working together on these things, is now quite uh, forthright about the need to understand m mineral value chains, in particular in, in Africa, but indeed all value chains. Now, one of the difficulties we came across in, in our discussions right from the beginning was policy documents from the Chamber of Mines which said that uh, they are doing beneficiation, but they distinguish between mining beneficiation and manufacturing beneficiation. And they also say that the mining industry is a unique industry with particular dynamics and, and issues. And, uh, that it's a standalone industry. That's the argument. And they say they do mining beneficiation, which of course is true, in the sense that they do processing of all kinds and so on. But uh, only recently I've come up with an argument which is the, the counterattack to the Chamber of Mines position. And my counterattack at the moment is this. I accept that the mining industry is a unique industry. It has unique capital, unique skills, and unique uh, processes, and so on. And one must understand that the industry has certain needs and requirements, uh, and, and that must be understood by DMR and indeed by everybody else. But the product of that exercise, once it, an ore becomes a metal, then it becomes a social issue, and it's a matter for the country as a whole. So while the mining industry specializes in mining and uh, they've got all the skills and the capital they needed to do that, but once a product emerges from that process of, 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 of processing, then there's a national issue about what happens to the product. And uh, I've, tried, I've driven them to the wall to say, since the constitution says that minerals beneath the soil belong to the people of South Africa with the state as a custodian, then the product of the processing is also a matter for the national interest, especially as it is so critical for the economy. And it cannot be simply exported uh, in the way that most mines are doing at the moment, and therefore that's where the debate lies at the moment. Mining does its job, it produces metals, but what happens to the metals is a matter of national concern. And this is where this debate lies, in my view. <coughs> so we're beginning to look at the IPAP minerals, and we're looking at what are the obstacles to downstream and upstream uh, processing and beneficiation. And uh, the inquiry leads us primarily into economic factors. It's about markets, it's about prices, it's about uh, competition, it's about labor, it's about all those things. Very importantly, and each, each area has to be examined pretty rigorously. 
But there are also other problems. And this is where the research is leading us to a degree. And that is the institutional arrangements of South Africa. And uh, we are now convinced that if you focus only on the economic factors, the market issues, the pricing issues, transport issues, skills, all those things which are standard issues uh, covered by econom economists, and you do not examine the institutional environment in which those things are operating, you're missing half the plot. And so, in the course of lots of investigations and interviews, one comes down to three main problems. And this is the heart of what I see as the obstacles to uh, South Africa benefiting to the maximum of its mineral wealth. Uh, and this is not to say that we should not export mineral wealth. No one is arguing that. There's no either or about it. In fact, it's both. And I think, for example, Billiton, which produces, which has the biggest smelters in the world for manganese, uh, as I say, exports 75% of the manganese and 25% goes into steel, uh, domestic production. So what are the three main problems? Because one is trying to identify Going back to my very first question of four years ago, what are the obstacles to South Africa being a highly industrialized country uh, with the mineral base being a major element? And I identify three problems. The first one is a lack of coordination, both within departments and between departments. And this is uh, acknowledged in many cases, but it's not... Uh, it's, for example, in, it's in the Sims report. There is one paragraph in the huge Sims report which says coordination is a major problem. But I think it deserves more than a paragraph and it deserves quite serious attention because if we are going to really maximize the benefits of the mineral value chain, then coordination within departments and between departments is vital. The second obstacle is in the private sector. There are very serious problems of pricing within the private sector. Uh, there's import parity pricing, for example. I mean, we've discussed this a great deal. But there's also a short-termism culture. And at present time, the private sector is not committed to the long, many in the private sector, to the long-term development of South Africa. And as we all know, they're sitting on a lot of capital. And there is a quick, a culture of quick fixes and quick returns, which is very damaging. And you can't operate on quick returns in a mineral value chain because you require long-term investments and you require to take a long view, training, etc., etc. Mining is not a short-term uh, exercise. And so the, the whole question of price distortions along the whole value chain and the short-term view of, of business is a major problem. Finally, there is another major problem, my third, and that is the relationship between business and government. I think we all know, and you read about it in the papers every second day, that there is an uncomfortable, let's use a, a, a euphemism, a, an uncomfortable relationship between the private sector and government. Although there are all sorts of exercises which take place from time to time, there's the PICC, there's the new Pakisa development, which is clearly very welcome and could be quite important, where government and business and others sit down and work through policy. But nevertheless, there is a, a degree almost of confrontation between certain elements of the private sector, especially the mining industry, and government. And it seems to me that the reason for that is partly a denial that South Africa is a mixed economy and it's going to be a mixed economy for quite a long time. If you acknowledge that the South African economy is a mixed economy with a large state sector and an even larger private sector, then what follows absolutely is that the two have to find a way of interacting for the benefit of the national interest. And I'm afraid that that is not happening. But curiously, in, the, in this, this engagement, or, or lack of engagement, or rather un, unhelpful engagement, between government and the private sector, there are all sorts of misconceptions. For example, I find in talking to chief executives in the mining industry and in industry, 
that they feel intimidated by government. So, you know, yesterday we were told about the MEC complex and so on. Well, when I talk to Mr. MEC, <laughs> you know, he's terribly timid, <laughs> you know, and, and when you say, why are you so scared to speak out? He says, well, <laughs> we need tenders. We're subject to regulation. We're subject to legislation. We're subject to taxes. This, these institutions in government actually have a lot of powers. So, you know, if you want to nationalize the mining industry, you know, before you do that, please examine the powers that DMR actually has, uh, which are very substantial. And if you speak to lawyers who understand the mining law and the way DMR works uh, through inspectors and policing and all that, you can see that actually there is a huge dependence of this, these industries on government. And despite that dependence on government, uh, somehow the relationship doesn't work out to the maximum benefit of the national interest. And I want to inquire why. Similarly, the state, of course, depends on the private sector. The state isn't, you talk about a mining company, a state mining company, but you know, <laughs> the state is not going to be able to do without the Chamber of Mines for a long time. So it, it puzzles me. Why at a political level, and even if you like at an ideological level, we as a country are unable to resolve the question of what kind of mixed economy we are, what are the interrelationships that are required in a mixed economy, why we don't have the flexibility that people like China exercises, who handle the mixed economy very successfully, as we see, and, and so on, and it seems to me that this question of the interrelationship of the state and the mining industry in particular has to be examined very carefully to look at all the dynamics and, and so on. So the, 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 the point, uh, finally, just to say that I think a great deal of systems research is needed uh, to examine the totality of the relationship as well as the detailed analysis of particular mining chains on particular minerals. How does chrome work? Why is it that China produces ferrochrome, which we used to produce here? We have, in South Africa, we have smelters that can turn chrome into ferrochrome. Those smelters have shut down in the main, and that chrome is exported to China, which makes the ferrochrome and then re-imports it back to us. Why is it? that we can't produce rails for railways. It has to, we have to send the iron ore uh, to China who make rails and then bring it back here. I mean, think of the costs of transportation. There's so many examples where we export our primary products which have been processed to some degree and we export it to overseas and it comes back in the finished form. My father gave me a gold ring which unfortunately some robbers took away from me that gold ring was South African gold made in Italy. For goodness sake, if we can't make a gold ring, but we can make nuclear weapons, then there's some contradiction somewhere, and I wish you'd help me sort it out. Thanks very much. Thank